Hey, true believers, do you love politics? Do you love comic books? Well, superhero politics is for you. Combines the comical nature of politics and the political nature of comic books. Join us, like, share, and experience the world of comics and politics in a way that you never have before. This is superhero politics. And I'm your host, Michael Holmes. So it is over. It is done. The villain has been vanquished. Peace returns to the land. A calm rests over the nation. Or does it? Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Superhero Politics. And we are in Endgame. We are in in game. This is the kind of the theme of this episode here. It's, it's over. The end of an era or error, E-R-R-O-R, depending on uh, where you sit on the political spectrum. You know, Trump is gone. You know, yesterday... Um, or I should say, as I'm recording this, it is the 22nd. So we're into the second full day of the Biden administration. And congratulations to President Joseph R. Biden and uh, Vice President Kamala D. Harris as they uh, assume leadership of the country and preside over what is, you know, uh, generously called a divided nation. Um and, you know, extreme challenges that probably haven't been seen by any president in the history of this country. Um, but as I was watching the festivities of the inauguration yesterday, you know, there was obviously a lot of joy from uh, people on the left and centrist Democrats and some, you know, moderately conservative people who, you know, felt like, uh, you know, what Trump had done as president, you know, specifically in the last, you know, few weeks of his presidency was, you know, just, just too much to bear. And they, you know, they were ready to turn the page. Um, and so as, you know, I watched the festivities yesterday and I saw the joy throughout the country and, um, you know, posts on Facebook celebrating the administration, new administration and celebrating, uh, vice president Harris and, um, president Biden, uh, just, you know, you know, all the 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 posts of women in chucks and pearls and and, you know, people with the new hope um, posters for 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 Vice President Biden. And I mean, I'm sorry for President Biden. Uh, that's might take a little getting used to. But um, I, I didn't have the same feeling like I, I mean, I did. But it was. It was anticlimactic in a way. Um, and the reason that this episode is called Endgame is because, you know, I want to reference a specific scene from Avengers Endgame that kind of captures how I felt yesterday in this moment. And so, uh, you know, you guys bear with me. This is kind of a long clip, but I want you guys to listen to the whole thing because, you know, at the end of it, I think you will understand um, how I felt yesterday. What you see here is um, Thanos is dragging himself up the stairs. He is clearly like beat up and like completely bruised. And he's, you know, on his farm, you know, on his world on Titan. And he's he's just wiped out trillions of people, half the universe. And he's just trying to get some rest. And then at this moment, Captain Marvel like busts the, the, the ceiling and like attacks him. 
And then at this moment, you see the Bruce Banner and the and the Hulk Buster come out of the floor and like he, they restrain him. And then War Machine comes in. You know they have him. They have him bound. And at this moment, Thor comes in and he cuts off the hand with the Infinity Gauntlet on it. And they begin to question him about what he did with the stones. So listen. Telling them that he destroyed the stones. You should be grateful. And they went there to get the stones to bring everybody back. Where are the stones? Gone. Reduced to atoms. You used them two days ago. We used the stones to destroy the stones. And nearly killed me. But the work is done. It always will be. And this is the line I want you guys to listen to. I am inevitable. Inevitable. We have to tear this place apart. He has to be lying. My father is many things. A liar is not one of them. Oh. Thank you, daughter. Perhaps I treated you too harshly. And this is where Thor takes his head. Thor cuts off Thanos' head at the moment to exact revenge for Loki and for billions and trillions of people that Thanos snapped away. But if you if you look at this scene, if you look at how they all felt, then it will explain to you the, the crux of this episode. It's because they know that everything that Thanos had done cannot be reversed that for all their valiant effort to stop him for all of their effort to take him down and even at the moment where they ended him it didn't give them any satisfaction because of what he had done was already set in stone I mean half of all existence had been wiped out And they didn't even have the means to bring him back because he had destroyed the stones. And so when I when I was watching the inauguration yesterday, I I had this, you know, this feeling that. You know, when they cut off the head of Thanos in this in this film, they realized that they didn't just cut the head off the off the snake, that when they did cut the head off the snake, that it was a hydra. And that when one head popped off, more and more problems pop out, more heads pop out. And, you know, uh, this is a reference to to Hydra and we'll we'll, we'll get to that one in in another episode. But this was my sense when, you know, people were celebrating getting rid of Trump. But not realizing all of the problems that remained from his presidency. And I and, and I don't want to say they were unaware and I know it was a moment of euphoria, but you know, I I'm a realist, you know, I'm a I'm a pragmatist. You know, so, you know, when I look at when I look at things, I look at things as, you know, what are the scenarios that could happen? What are the, the what are the possibilities? So, like Doctor Strange looks at 14 billion you know, scenarios and they only win in one, you know, I'm in that camp. And so yesterday I, you know, I, I celebrated, I was happy. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe that Donald Trump was good for America. I don't believe he was a good president. I don't believe he was engaged in the job. Um, you know, you know, personal animosity towards him, you know, it's, it's hard not to have it, but, you know, I know from, you know, being an elected official that you don't have to earn that. Like, that's not something that you have to earn. Like, there are literally just people who, because you're the candidate that won and the candidate that they preferred did not, that they're just not going to like you. It doesn't matter what you do. 
doesn't matter how you perform, that they're just not going to like you. But Donald Trump earned the antipathy of the American people and the world. And so, you know, as he left, you know, to, to go off to Florida to, you know, seek refuge on his own Titan, you know, the world celebrated and the world rejoiced. But it didn't change the world that he left. There's still 400,000 Americans that died on his watch. There are millions of people who are uh, unemployed and underemployed and, and, and struggling with uh, you know food and, and housing and everything. And there are, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who can't get the vaccine because now it's come out that he didn't even have a plan for distribution. So you cut the head off the snake, but three or four more heads pop up. And so as we um, get into the Biden administration, we have to realize that there are acolytes of Trump everywhere. You know, the same Republicans that are that were so eager when we had a full employment economy to cut taxes for the richest people in this country are now saying, oh, well, we can't spend any money to bring COVID relief to the people of this country. And so, you know, my um, advice to America and to the American people is you have to temper your expectations because if you remember the rest of the movie, it skipped ahead five years. Like from the moment Thor took his head for five years, the Avengers, the earth, all of existence languished under what Thanos had wrought. And it will be very similar here in America. Even though President Biden yesterday, God bless him, and his arm is probably falling off right now. He signed so many executive orders, reversing things. But those things are not immediate. Those things are not permanent. And so with razor thin majorities in the House and the Senate, they can't afford any missteps. They don't have any latitude to be able to uh, work things out. They have to have everything. uh, You know, the plan is has to be flawless almost. And Republicans have already signaled they're not in a conciliatory mood. They're not, you know, reflexive over what they've done. They don't say, well, you know, we made a mistake. Now we have to, you know, follow president Biden and fixing this problem that we created. No, of course not. Have you ever met a Republican? So the challenge that the Biden administration faces won't be fixed this year or next year or the year after that, or even the year after that, just like it took, the Avengers five years to come up with any sort of plan to restore reality is going to take the Biden administration that long to unpack all the damage that the Trump administration did. Now we're talking about levels and levels and levels of government. Now we're talking about, you know, agencies that haven't been staffed. We're talking about agencies that have been staffed with, Uh, loyalist, you know, it's ironic when you listen to, um, when the, when Trump came in, he talked about the deep state. He talked about, you know, Obama loyalists who were there to thwart his agenda. And it was just projection because now what do you have is you have them working furiously, even the night before the inauguration to install someone at DHS who was a loyalist to Trump. And so not only has President Biden had to sign 
executive orders reversing all manner of things. He's also had to fire people that were loyalists to Trump and have pledged to resist the new president's agenda. Like, it's almost having to shift between Avengers Endgame and Captain America Winter Soldier because what you have is you've lopped off the head of Thanos and now you got to go deal with Hydra that's embedded into the American government. And I told you we get back to Hydra uh, later. That was a little segue earlier. But now you got to realize, like, he's got to uncover and unpack loyalists to Trump. And it's not just in government agencies. You saw the video where when the insurrection happened on January 6th, you had police officers, Capitol Police officers taking selfies with the insurrectionists. You had them opening the gates. You had them leading leading the insurrectionists through the halls of Congress while they were hunting for congressmen, for the Speaker of the House. Like, the, the tentacles of Donald Trump and the effects of Donald Trump will not be purged because Donald Trump is gone. And let's be honest, he's really not gone. He's out there on the periphery because what's going to happen is Republicans are already pushing back the Senate impeachment trial. They're already pushing it back. They're trying to push it back and they're saying, well, we've got to give him time to mount a defense. And what they're doing is they're fortifying their reasoning to not convict him. And see, when they don't convict him, which I don't even understand why they wouldn't, it's idiotic. Because if they don't convict him and then have the separate vote to bar him from running for federal office again, that means he can run in 2024. And so he can spend the entire time that he's out of office these four years criticizing and dogging Joe Biden the same way that he did Barack Obama four years before he ran for president. And I know you'll say, but he's been he's been deplatformed. That's already the word for 2021. He's been deplatformed, Mike. Like he's not on Twitter. He's not on Facebook. Fox News has turned against him. You know, the, the Proud Boys are turned against him. Parler has turned against him. everybody's turned against him for now. Everybody's turned against him for now. Two years from now. If Joe Biden is able to pass his agenda, this ambitious, very progressive agenda, do you actually think that Republicans will not mount the socialist claim and run against this? No matter what the economy looks like, no matter what the country looks like, Republicans are going to run against socialism. It's all they have left. It's all they have left. It's like they have one of the infinity stones and they're going to, they're going to use it to the fullest, fullest extent of his power. So here we have Donald Trump who is, you know, on Titan right now in Florida. And we're going to call, you know, Mar-a-Lago Titan. Um, he's there, he's rehabilitating, he's licking his wounds, but you know, that he is not taking this lightly. And depending on what happens with some of his legal problems, if he's able to weather those storms, he will absolutely reemerge sometime in the next three years and reassert his, his dominance over the Republican party. So what does that mean for the rest of the party? That means that they will have to deal with Donald Trump. Now, you know, strategically, the Democrat in me will say, well, that's good, right? Because if they're fighting amongst themselves, if they're having a civil war, then that just, you know, makes it easier for Democrats to win. Not necessarily. Because what we found is that Republicans 
conservatives hate Democrats far, far more than they um, have differences amongst themselves. The galvanizing force for conservatives is their hatred of, hatred of Democrats and progressivism. It's not conservative values. It's not policy. It's hatred for us. If you think back to anything that, Don, that, that Trump supporters said that the reason that they voted for him is because it drove liberals nuts. Madison Cawthorn um, is from my home state of North Carolina, and he's a freshman rep. And his first tweet was, cry more libs. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, very uh, professional there, but that's the galvanizing force. And there would, there would be nothing more... Um, there would there'd be nothing more that would drive conservatives would be and to vindicate them than to have Donald Trump reelected as president after four years of being out of power. So they have reason to want failure by the Biden administration. Now it hurts us all, but Right now, they're grieving. They're grieving the loss of their leader. And so that always would make me wonder, like, where, you know, during that time, you know, after the snap, like, where did the Black Order go? Like, where did where did Ebony Maul and all those guys go uh, after the snap? Like, did it take any of them? And I, I'm trying to remember. But what you're seeing is that you're seeing the difference between how Democrats have approached Donald Trump and how Republicans have approached approached Donald Trump. Um, and so, you know, here we are at the at the end of this administration. And now we're struggling to deal with the fallout, because if you remember in game, like people just kind of wandered around for for years like. You know, loved ones were there and now they're gone. You see neighborhoods dilapidated, you know, people just, you know, waking up, trying to figure out how to navigate the world. And it was the same for the Avengers. You know, Thor famously went off um, and got fat and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the rest of the Avengers just kind of languished. So. This is where we are right now. Like we're in this point. Like yes, there's this euphoria that um, Donald Trump is gone, but what now? Like how do we solve the problem of the remnants of this administration? Not just from a policy standpoint, because though that's actually the one thing that we can fix. Like we can fix the policy. Like we can look at you know. Um, you know, monetary policy and interest rates. Like the one of the the things that uh, you know President Biden signed was an extension of the moratorium uh, forbearance on student loans and put the interest rate at zero. Like those are policy specific things that can be that can be um, fixed. But what about the psyche of our country? Like what about the the, the soul of our country, you know, in his uh, inaugural address, President Biden said that this election um, was a, a battle for the soul of America. Now, you would say, OK, well, he won. So I'm guessing that, you know, that the soul has been restored. No. We're a deeply, 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 deeply divided nation. And the anger and the frustration is palpable. Like you can, like you can cut it. And so we have to worry about this bubbling over again. Like we had an insurrection. We had 
people literally storm the Capitol, break in, murder people. They built gallows on the lawn of the Capitol. They were going to hang the vice president. They were going to murder the speaker of the house. They were going to, you know, destroy the ballot certifying the election. And then these people just thought they were going to go home, like get on the plane, drive back home and just go home. Like nothing had happened. Why? Because Donald Trump had made them believe that the proper state of things was him being in power. Now, one of the stones on the Infinity Gauntlet, and I have one here. Um, I'll tell you guys about that story a little later uh, in another episode. But um, one of the stones is the reality stone. And what it does is it allows the, 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 the wearer of the gauntlet to shape reality around them and bend it to their will. Donald Trump bent political reality to his will. Now, we have to straighten it out because he's gone, yes, but reality, the reality he created is still there. And there are millions and millions of people out there who are to this day, two days into the Biden administration, two days after the inauguration, two days after he took the oath of office and was sworn in, that are still saying that he's going to. He's going to come up with a plan and that this is all part of the grand scheme of Donald Trump to reassert himself and take power and jail all of the usurpers. And they're holding on to this like they are holding on to this knowledge. Now, we've never seen before in this country someone possess this much sway over this larger group of American people. Now you will look at Donald Trump and say, he is not charismatic. He's not exceptionally bright. He doesn't have those, you know, qualities that, you know, people, people gravitate to in a positive fashion. How did he do it? What he did was he unlocked, he unlocked what was already brewing within us. So this is why I felt like it was important that you guys um, listen closely to the line where Thanos said that he was inevitable. Donald Trump was inevitable. He was always going to happen. And it began far, far decades before he came to power. He was always going to happen. Why? Because. This country was is, is changing, and that change is inevitable. And so when you have held power for so long, and you see the winds of change coming, and you are desperate to stop it, you will do and embrace any methods that you can to stave off the inevitable. And so as you see the rise of women and you see the rise of minorities and you see us fully embracing the, the core value of us being a nation of immigrants in a melting pot and you're in the majority that, have, that has always held power, that fear can cause you to make choices that is outside of your character. Or maybe it is your character because the, the, the most revealing thing that we've seen in the era of Donald Trump is we got to really know our friends and family. We got to really know them. We got to see underneath and we got to see the darkest corners of ourselves. So this is why it's not easy just to go back. Just to believe that the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the, you know, deposing of Donald Trump is going to fix us. 
Because we were fundamentally flawed and damaged before Donald Trump. He just finished breaking us. Now, I'm going to play advocate's devil here. Don't, y'all don't get mad. Uh, I'm going to play advocate's devil here. Devil's advocate, I should say. Um, there's a silver lining to Donald Trump. And that silver lining is that we can't put it back in the bottle. We can't stuff it in the closet. We can't hide it anymore. We can't say with our hands over our chest, clutching our pearls, this is not who we are. We're bigger than this. This is not the America that I know. Because yes, it is. And we owe Donald Trump, I'm not going to say owe, but we can credit Donald Trump for making us face the reality of what America is. Because now, without knowing and acknowledging exactly the complete and utter frailty of our democracy, of our national character we could never completely fix it but now that we can joe biden in his inaugural inaugural address said that we need to confront and face white supremacy and defeat it now i don't know of any president who's ever said that in an address any elected official And he said it from the steps of the Capitol to the entire world watching. So we are we're definitely on the precipice of of a, a new a new national attitude. The question is, can we maintain it? Can we defend? against Donald Trump's rise again or a new Donald Trump? Will we come out of this stronger? Will we be able to hold fast this very tenuous grasp that we have on our democracy? Can we repair the damage to our relationships? We can fix our economy. We can't. We can't. We can fix our relationships with our allies abroad. We can we can actually bring equity. um, You know, to our country, we can do all those things through policy. But do we have the strength. To repair and face down. Those more existential things like goodness and virtue. And brotherhood. That I'm not so sure about. So. As we approach the dawn of a new day. Um, as we're into a, to a new day. Um, you know, hopefully I will eventually start to feel. Um, you know, the same hope and joy that. uh the rest of the world feels right now, but, you know, looking, looking at the task ahead, you know, it's daunting. So, um, I just hope that we're up to it as a country. And I hope that we're ever vigilant against this happening again. And the reason that I say this, and this is not just talking to the Republican party, you know, this is also talking to the democratic party because, you know, with the Republican Party reeling right now and, and, and falling apart, there is, you know, an opportunity for the progressive movement to seize power that they'd never had before. And you know what they say about power and, and power absolute. 
And, you know, I need to warn us against creating our own Thanos slash Trump on, on the, on the left. And I know you're saying like, damn, Mike, like how you both sides this? And I'm not both sides in this. This is a pragmatic warning. The one thing that Thanos had, and I'm going to say this because all, every villain believes that they're the hero. And Thanos truly, truly believed that he was doing the right thing for the universe. He made his, he made some very well reasoned arguments for his agenda. And the thing that he said was balance as all things should be. This country needs to have a balance between our progressive ideals and our conservative pragmatism. If we're going to achieve a more perfect union, we have to have that. And if we don't have a functioning conservative alternative in this country, we run the risk of driving ourselves into the very thing in the very position that Thanos talked about and that he was combating. The last thing that we want to do as progressives is vindicate the villain. Like we don't want to vindicate the villain. So we have to be cognizant of our own power and we can't let it consume us either. And, you know, you know, as I go into, you know, the second year of my term, you know, I look at what we're attempting to do, you know, in the city and, you know, we have support for that, but, you know, you never want to lose sight of those, who may not support what you're doing. And so, you know, there's always the risk that you can overreach. And there's always a, a risk that, you know, the power that you hold ultimately is what takes you down. You know, Thanos used the stones to destroy the stones. And as he said, it almost killed him. So they just serve to remind him and tempt him to continue to do things that was outside of the, the plan. So um, best of luck to President Biden and Vice President Harris. Best of luck to the country. Best of luck to the world. You know, we are going to work to rebuild, you know, as the Avengers traverse time and brought the stones from from a different time to come back to to restore reality uh, to what we knew. That's the work that we have to do now. We have to take extraordinary measures to return our reality to what we knew to some sort of normalcy. But it's going to take us all. It's going to take a united team of powerful individuals, powerful people, powerful communities to get our country back to where um, where it needs to be. So I'm hopeful, um, ever increasingly hopeful that we can do that. And, you know, I believe we can overcome any challenge. If we're united until next time, this is superhero politics and I am your host, Michael Holmes. What's going on? True believers. Thank you for your continued and growing support. Uh, if you're enjoying the content that we're producing here on superhero politics, I ask that you subscribe anywhere that you can find podcasts. That means iTunes, uh, Apple podcasts, 
Spotify, Stitcher. Uh, you can find us at Buzzsprout uh, and also on our social media at Superhero Politics on Twitter, at Superhero Politics on Facebook, Superhero Politics on Instagram, and Superhero Politics on TikTok. Um, like, share, join us. And if you would have any uh, topics that you would like to share or just questions that you would like to ask me, uh, you can send your emails to Superhero Politics at gmail.com and uh, we'll do an episode where we answer your questions thank you for your continued support and remember always speak truth to power